Happy Sunday, everyone. Happy Sunday. <clears throat> you happy to be alive? Yes. We just had an incredible conference with pastors from all around the country, from our movement. And, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that this morning. I think Reverend Doom maybe will talk about that a little bit, uh, tribal messiahship and those kinds of things during the announcements. So uh, I'm going to present uh, a message which is kind of a shameless promotion of the one-day seminar. <laughs> so I wanted to convey to you the contents of the one-day seminar, half-day seminar, in about 30 minutes. So are you OK? Can you hold still for 30 minutes? Yes. So I need you, you to be with me on this one, OK? We're going to move kind of quickly. <clears throat> I promise there's going to be an inspirational message that's going to inspire you for the whole week, OK? Are you with me? Yes. Okay. So, God's blessing. Pathway to happiness. Are you happy? Yes. yes. Uh, we'll see. <clears throat> okay. I wish I had the clicker, but there's no clicker. So, next slide. And next slide. Okay, who recognizes this? Okay, I hope most people recognize it. If you open up the Divine Principle book, the first line is, please read it with me. Everyone is struggling to attain happiness and avoid misfortune. Okay, so if you want to be happy, you came to the right place, okay? Yeah. Family Federation is a place to find happiness. So I want to talk about happiness and a lot of other things. Okay, next slide. Okay, what makes you happy? Okay, quick. Shout out, shout out a few things. What makes you happy? God, lots of money, love, babies, <laughs> friends. Okay, a lot of things make us happy. Yeah, to be with the ones you love, to have the things you want, to win the lottery, to have great sex. You know, there are a lot of things that make people happy, right? Let's see if this works. Well, let's see, which way am I going here? Uh, that way, right? Okay, we'll make it. Okay. All right. But I want to take this approach. I want to say that God created us in the state to be happy. Okay? That's kind of the default state of existence. We were made to be happy. All right? So then the question is, why aren't we happy some of the times, or even a lot of the times? Okay? So I want to ask, what prevents us from being happy? And I'm going to mention a few points. Number one, I don't like myself. This is the number one point. You look inside yourself, what do you see? You look in the mirror, what do you see? The flow, the stream of consciousness that goes in your mind. And I ask you, are you really happy? Okay. And there's a part of you which will say, no. I don't like myself. That's because in your deep original mind, there's a part of you that knows you were created to be much, much more than what you are. Okay? Second point. I'm not happy because I don't love others and others don't love me. That's a big reason why people are not happy. If you don't have relationships of love, life is empty. It is dead. Okay? So one reason we don't find real happiness is because we're not really, really able to love another person and other people don't truly love me. Third point, I don't have material blessings, right? If your material situation is bad, you cannot be happy. If you're sick, you're miserable, you know? If you have no place to sleep, you have no food. If you have nothing, you have nowhere to go. You cannot be happy. Right? Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Fourth point. I have no future. Yeah, no matter how good you are now, you have everything in the world. You have love. You have everything. But you find out that you're going to die tomorrow morning. Will you jump for joy? I don't think so. You just fell in love. And the person you fell in love with is, it dies the next day. Are you going to be happy? No. So happiness needs to be guaranteed in the future to really be happy. And last point, my world is messed up. 
You cannot be happy if the world around you is going to hell. If your nation goes to war and a bomb gets dropped on your head, you're not going to be happy, right? No matter how much wealth you have, if your next-door neighbor is dying of starvation, can you be happy? No, you cannot be. Okay, so these are five points that I thought of that make it really difficult for us to be happy. So the good news is we're going to solve all these problems. Isn't that great? Okay. So the key point is your individual self, okay? That's where it starts. You as an individual need to like yourself. You need to feel good about yourself. How is that supposed to happen? You know, some schools these days are doing these programs where they're trying to tell kids, you're good, you're wonderful, or I'm good, I'm wonderful. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> we weren't designed to be, feel good about myself because I say, oh, I feel good about me. The beginning point of feeling good about yourself is that you were to be loved from your birth by God. You were to have this incredible love supposed to flow into you from God, ideally through your parents, okay? And then you're supposed to grow up, and your heart is supposed to become close to God's heart. And that's the beginning point of happiness. Amen? Yeah. Okay. So the problem here is that growth of your heart is not a guaranteed thing. God controls everything in the universe, but he does not control the human heart. That is your responsibility. So in the divine principle we teach, there's a human portion of responsibility, right? And what is that for? It is to grow your heart to connect with God, right? Okay. How are we supposed to do that, okay? How is it supposed to work? How do we know how to grow our heart, okay? You're born in this world, someone's got to tell you, right? And God says, oh, that's me. <laughs> that's my job. I'm your parent. I'm your heavenly parent. I made you. I'm going to let you know how to grow your heart, okay? And basically it's this. It's God's love guidance. Can you say God's love guidance? God's love guidance. Okay. So usually we put here God's word or God's truth in the divine principle, but I want to put here guidance. Because the way this works, it has to be through your conscience. Your conscience has to kind of guide you through this, okay? Then what is your responsibility? And I divide it into three points. Number one, you've got to know what it is. You have to know what God's guidance is. If you don't know what it is, you can't do it, right? Okay, number two, you have to commit to that. In the divine principle, this is called the condition of faith. That's a very religious term, so I'm just going to say, basically, you need to commit yourself to the guidance that God gives you through your conscience. All right? And then the third point is you've got to do it. And when you do it, what's going to happen is you're going to become it. And the divine principle calls this substance, foundation of substance, okay? It means in doing and practicing God's love guidance, you actually are going to become this person who embodies God's love. Isn't that great? Okay. So the third step, you get a bonus. The fourth one comes for free. That's you become it, all right? So what is God's love guidance? If you look in the Bible, we see God's love guidance. It's basically contained in two points. The first point is called the three blessings. God gives us three blessings. God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and then... Right, let's do it again. Be fruitful then... You got it, okay? It's not multiply, then become fruitful, okay? So what it means to be fruitful is the individual maturity of heart. To multiply means the romantic sexual love between a man and a woman, right? So God is saying in the three blessings, first you become a true person. First you become my son or daughter, and then you can make babies, okay? Then you can make a family. So the first love guidance is what? Maintain the proper order of love, right? So first you become a true person of love with God as a son and daughter, <clears throat> and then you can engage in the other kind of love, the romantic and sexual love. Okay, second point. God gives a commandment in the Bible, right? He says, of all the trees you can eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that fruit, you must not touch or eat that fruit. 
What is that fruit? It's the only thing that can be either good or evil. And what is the one thing God does not control? What is the one thing God does not control? The human heart. That means everything else in the universe it is always going to be good because God made it to be good. Amen? So what's the one thing that might go the way of good or evil? The human heart. You got it. Okay? So when God said, don't eat the fruit of good or evil, what is he talking about? He's talking about love, the direction of our love. And he's basically saying, abstain. Don't partake of this, you know, romantic sexual stuff at this time. So God gave two guidances in reference to love, right? So what we need to do is we need to know and understand those through our conscience and then practice it, do it, uh, I'm sorry, commit to it, make a commitment to it, and then do it and become it. Everyone's with me so far? Great. Okay, if we had done so, we would have fulfilled the three blessings. Three blessings are what? First, we would have grown to become a true person, God's son or daughter. Okay? Then, God would have blessed us in marriage to multiply. And then, the third blessing was to have dominion over all things. So we solve several problems here. First of all, when you become a true person, you're going to really, really like yourself. I promise. Okay? You're going to feel so good about yourself every time you wake up in the morning. Okay? And then, to, find, to love and be loved is going to come really easily. Because when you become that true person, others are going to naturally want to love you. One time, River Moon said, the perfect plus will always attract the perfect minus. If you become a person of love as a true man, don't worry, that true woman is going to be attracted to you. And if you become that beautiful woman of God, don't worry, that man is going to be attracted to you. So we solve the second problem, okay? The third problem, to have things, okay? Don't worry, because when you become a couple whom God dwells with, he's going to give you his creation. He's going to give you blessing. You're going to become very rich, okay? Don't ask me how right now, but... <laughs> I just am going to guarantee that when you learn to love God and you learn to love things the way God loves them, money will come to your door. It'll come knocking at your door. I guarantee it. Okay? Then, those are th that, what are the other points? The fourth point is your future. You need a future. Well, the good news is that when you perfect yourself, your spiritual senses will become open, okay? And you will see that the future is eternal, okay? You don't need to worry about dying tomorrow or your loved one dying, that you are eternal and the ones you love are eternal, okay? So the future doesn't become a problem, right? You solve that. And the last problem is the world is in a huge mess, okay? So we need to find the way, not only to fulfill these three blessings in my life, but we need to make a determination that I need to make this world better. Otherwise, it's not, it ain't going to work, okay? So you can't just go off and do the three blessings somewhere. You, we have to actually make this world a better place. Okay, how am I doing with time? I hope I'm okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the human fall. To fix things, we need to know how they got messed up. And why didn't that first man and woman become that person of love, that man and woman of love? I'm going to go very quickly here, but basically it has to do with false love guidance. Can you say that? False love guidance. False love guidance. <laughs> right. In other words, the first man and woman were told, hey, you don't have to listen to God's guidance about love. You can just take love for yourself. You can have love for you. We call that me love, okay? Me love, okay? So what happened was, the first man and woman believed that, they acted upon it, and they changed themselves, okay? They got into this kind of false love, self-centered love from the beginning. So the whole story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, he was coming to Eve and saying to her, you don't have to listen to what God says, listen to what I have to say. Hey, you can take things for yourself. You can be like God, okay? So love became self-centered. And that first family, not only did they, they become self-centered, but they brought forth a family, which makes up you and I, the human family, that's this tree, which came out of that false love. 
And that's why we, you and I, when we look at ourselves, we don't always like ourselves. That's why our human family is in such bad shape. Okay? Okay, so how do we fix this? What we need is we need to get back to God's love. If man and woman had kept God's way, love would have begun with the truth, it would have been inspirational, uplifting, and would have produced joy, incredible joy, okay? The false love, the root of unhappiness, was based upon what? Jealousy, right? Deception, temptation, seduction, and the result was Adam and Eve felt shame and fear, right? They went running and hid themselves, okay? So this is where we got ourselves. This is where we're supposed to be. If the first family had come together in this way with true love, all humanity, the tree of the human family, would have been incredible. We would all be born into this world of true love. We all would have grown up with this love of God. All right? So, that's where I am, okay? This is Andy Compton here. Yeah. The reality is, I didn't come out of this tree. This tree never got planted. The first man and woman never made it happen. So how to fix this? What's the way to fix it? How do you make this tree, this rotten tree here, into this tree? That was God's problem. How can I get things back the way they're supposed to be? Okay, and it's not so complicated. God says, oh, I'm going to plant a new tree. Yeah, I'm going to bring a new Adam. I'm going to bring a new Eve. They're going to be my son, my daughter. And I'm going to plant my love in this world the way I originally meant it to be. Okay? And then doing that, all those who are on that bad tree, like Andy Compton, can be cut off and engrafted into this new lineage, this new tree of God, God's family. So that was God's strategy. Okay, now, the problem is, if God sends his son and daughter to this world, will this world welcome them? It won't. It's a bad world. And when righteous people come and try to change things, the world says, uh-uh, we're not going to change. We're going to kill you. Okay? So when Jesus came to this world to bring God's love and to change the world, what did the world do? The world said, uh-uh, we're not going to take it from you. We're going to kill you. So this is a problem for God. So before God can send the new Adam, the new Eve, before God can create that seed to bring love into this world, first, he has to kind of prepare the soil. Okay? So how does God prepare the soil? How does God get people to move to his side so that he can create an environment in which he can bring this beautiful family into the world? How to do that? And what God does is he follows his original plan for the first man and woman. He follows the same plan. He says, okay, I'm going to give you guidance, and then I want you to understand it, know it. I want you to commit to it, have faith in it, and then I want you to do it, act it out. And then you can become my people, okay? So God needed to create this kind of soil in which he could plant the coming of the, his son, the Messiah. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of history, 6,000 years of history in about 90 seconds, Okay? <laughs> Okay, so how do we move closer to God's side? By receiving God's guidance, okay? So what you see is, Abraham, God comes and he talks to him. He says, Abraham, and Abraham says, what? He says, I'm God, and this is what I want you to do, right? And then God comes to Moses, right? Remember? Everyone knows about Moses? He says, Moses, and Moses says, what? He says, I'm God, and Moses says, okay. And God says, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do, okay? Going to give you the Ten Commandments. Right? So what is happening? When Jesus comes, Jesus comes and he preaches to the people. He gives people God's guidance about love and truth. Right? So what God has needed through history is that when he gives guidance through Abraham and Moses and Jesus, he needs the people to know it, commit to it, and then practice it. Do it in their lives and become people of God. So this is God's strategy. So over the course of human history, after Adam and Eve fell, according to the Bible, these are biblical years, it was 2,000 years to Abraham. Those are years of great darkness. People lived in very primitive situations. 
human sacrifices, all these satanic gods and things, right? Then with Abraham, things began to change. Then Moses, God gave the Ten Commandments and changed, things changed a lot through Moses. And that enabled the soil to be, to be prepared through the course of 2,000 years for the birth of Jesus. And Jesus brought God's guidance. And how did Jesus guide us? He taught three important things. He taught people, believe in me. He taught people, follow me. And he taught people, love me. And you'll be saved. And you'll come back to God. Jesus taught, believe in me, follow me, love me. The tragedy is, at the time of Jesus, the religious people God had prepared through Moses, called the Jewish people, they mistook Jesus. They thought he was actually an evil demon of some kind. They called him Beelzebub. And they refused to believe in him. They refused to follow him. And they refused to love him. And sadly, in the end, even Peter, his closest disciple, would deny Jesus three times. So, go back. 2,000 years later, Jesus has been working for 2,000 years. This is the Christian faith. From the resurrection of Jesus, which we just celebrated Easter morning, a few weeks back, right? For 2,000 years, Jesus has been preparing the way, trying to help prepare the soil in this world through the Christian faith for God to plant that seed, finally. Okay? Then we come to today, Right? And today the world has changed. 2,000 years after Jesus, the time has come for God to reveal his guidance once again. And that guidance, we believe, is called the divine principle. What is the divine principle? Okay? It's a revelation that Jesus gave to Reverend Sam Young Moon when he was a young man, 15 years old, on Easter morning. That was back in 1935. At that time, Jesus revealed to him Incredible insight about the Bible and this effort of God to give his guidance to humanity through history. And one of the key points Jesus told Reverend Moon was, the time for salvation as individuals needs to go to the next step. I want you to bring families to God, not individuals. I want you to bring families, husbands and wives to God. That's the new age that is coming. So there's a remarkable history, if you look at it. From Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. Abraham to Jesus was 2,000 years. So after Jesus and his path to the cross and the beginning of the Christian faith, 2,000 years brings us to the second coming. And the second coming, what is his mission? Revelations 19, the Bible tells us, and Mrs. Moon mentioned it as we saw the Peace TV, right? It is the marriage supper of the Lamb. The concluding point of Scripture is the Messiah will come and find his bride. There's going to be a wedding. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Amen? Amen. Good. Yeah. So a wedding means a man and woman together, like Adam and Eve in the garden. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? And they're going to plant this new seed, and they're going to bring forth God's lineage, God's family in this world. So that's why Jesus told Reverend Moon, you've got to create that family. Your job is not to save individuals, but to create that family. Okay? So in 1960, in obedience to Jesus, Reverend Moon invested all of his energy in his life to create that family. We don't have time now to go into it, but it was a difficult course. What God wants the most, Satan will fight against the most. So if you look up Reverend Moon on the internet, you'll see all kinds of things said about him. He went through great struggles and misunderstanding and rejection to finally, in 1960, and the anniversary for this wedding is coming up very soon, he found this incredible woman. God guided him to this amazing woman, Hak Jahan. And together they, in 1960, fulfilled this goal of this wedding of God to make a family. And then, with that, he began with great power and excitement to teach the world what Jesus told him to teach, which is the family. We need to come to God as husband and wife together. That's the way we'll build God's kingdom on this earth. 
Amen. And so, from that point, in the 1960s, he began doing that, and people began to realize, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to go to heaven with my spouse. So couples began coming. First, 36 couples. Then, 72 couples. Then, you know, uh, 124 couples. Then, 430 couples. My wife and I, we were blessed. 2,075 couples at Madison Square Garden, right? Okay. <laughs> So, Reverend Moon is saying to the world, look, there's this tree of the world, okay, that came from the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. There's a tree which was, is rooted in what? It's rooted in jealousy, deception, temptation, seduction, shame, and fear, okay? And now there's a new tree based upon God's love, based upon the truth that's inspirational, uplifting, and joyful, so we can just say, which tree would you like to be a part of? <laughs> which tree do you think will lead you to happiness? The tree of God's love. You got it. You are brilliant. So what, what is the blessing of marriage ceremony? It's very simple. It's just inviting people to come from this tree and become part of this tree. That's the ceremony of the blessing of marriage, which Reverend Moon conducts. Okay. So, how do we get there? It goes back to where we started, God's guidance. Okay? What kind of guidance? We need to know it first. If you don't know God's guidance, you can't, you can't do it. That's why we teach divine principle. That's why we do one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody might invite you to study divine principle with them. That's why I'm going to be teaching a one-day seminar on May 7th. <laughs> See, that's my little promotion. <laughs> okay. So first you have to know it. Then once you know it, it's not enough. Right? Adam and Eve didn't really commit to what God told them. So we need to commit our lives to that guidance, even though it's difficult. Even though it's difficult. But if you do that, and then you practice it, you get a free bonus. You get what? You're going to become a son and daughter of God. It's going to happen naturally if you just put that guidance into practice. And then we're going to fulfill the three blessings and we're going to be really, really happy. Thank you very much.